what is Biospheric Project and how was it conceived? Um, well, the whole the Biospheric Foundation, the Biospheric Project, really has grown out of my PhD research. Um, so my PhD looks at how you develop socio-ecological urban research practice uh, within urban environments. But more interestingly, it's actually about geographically positioning research where it's needed. Uh, so taking it out of universities, uh, taking on buildings like this um, to challenge the way we develop ecological services and food production and, and systems. How do you get the community to work and engage with you? We have a, div a very diverse community here um, and that what that means um, is you have to develop lots of different interventions uh, of getting people in the community engaged. Uh, that's one of the strong points about the project, like we develop aquaponic systems and sort of hydroponic systems and biofacades and agroforest systems and vertical systems. At the same time we develop whole food shops and um, whole box delivery service and what that enables to do is speak to the community in a very very diverse way uh, meaning that people can engage in the project in many different ways so some people in the community come into the forest garden and do sort of um, sort of yeah, look at looking after the trees with us. Some people in the community go into the shop and buy fruit and veg and whole foods from us. Uh, some of them come into workshops at the foundation through our biosphere urban activities. How accessible will the food produced here be to, to, to the public? Yeah, very accessible. This that's the reason we we have a whole food store yeah, and we have a, um, a whole box delivery service. So the food that can get produced here. Uh, can go straight into yeah the either 78 steps of the whole box um, and that's delivered straight to the community uh, but on the other side side yeah there is a commercial asset to the project so we do work with restaurants as well how can these types of projects become self-supporting and economical um well that's a very very difficult uh, thing about these projects that with this project was born out of 300 pound um, on a phd um, and to date we've raised lots of different funding um, um, streams yeah, through lots of different interventions. So through community interventions, through to research uh, and entrepreneurial uh, interventions. Um, and that's the real trick. Uh, it's very easy getting capital um, money for these projects, but it's very hard getting revenue costs. Um, and that means actually you have to be very entrepreneurial. Uh, and create business so you can generate revenue costs yourself uh, and that's a process that we're going through at the moment so this project the biosphere foundation is testing systems which we can commercialize so for example the mushrooms we've been researching them for 14 months and we're now just about to commercialize that uh, project so we're in very early stages of the research um, and the commercialization of the project Will the biospheric project be enough to fulfil a community's food demands or will we still need to rely on supermarkets? Um, without doubt we'll have to rely on supermarkets. Um, the project, the, the, the biospheric foundation and biospheric project is not about how we feed this community. Yeah. What it is about is how do you develop systems that we start challenging the way we might age to feed communities. It's simply not good enough to grow food in urban environments through raised beds or orchards or meanwhile sites. We have to have a range of different food systems, just like an architect have a range of different archetypes of how a building would sit within a certain space. Well, we have to, as deep ecologists, we have to understand, well, we need a much more diverse way of developing advanced ecological systems that sit within land-based systems, that sit within buildings, that sit within roofs, that sit within uh, facades of buildings. Uh, there's a whole range of questions that needs to be answered. Um, and the foundation is at very early stages of trying to challenge um, and come up with some interesting possibilities to, to then questions. What is the difference between resilience and sustainability? Well, sustainability is dead. Uh, it means nothing. Um, everybody uses it right across the board, so it's got no meaning. Uh, resilience is actually, it's got six different meanings uh, through different disciplines. Um, and also resilience is about how a system becomes stronger through disturbance. Um, so there's an actual like there's a natural design um, question that needs to be answered by people like deep ecology and architects. How do you make stuff that is resilient? Um, and you can test that then 
uh, you can research it. Sustainability, you can't do that because it's lost its meaning. Um, so going for, forward, the reason re resilience is a hot topic at the moment because it's actually got some stuff, substance that can be tested and trialled uh, and hopefully as that happens within research we can start to commercialise the ideas. How have other fields of expertise contributed to this project? Oh, there's a whole range of different expertise uh, that have been absolutely central uh, to the, this program. Um, what's different between this and a university is we bring a whole range of different disciplines, architects, engineers, community, um, researchers, and they actually work together. When I would argue in universities that they don't do that. They sit within their own silo. So you can't build a city with an architect. You know, what you need is an anthropologist, a socialist, ecological called designers, architects. You whole, need a whole range of people actually working together. Um, and it's one of the reasons I moved out of my, moved my research out of universities um, and positioned my own research lab because there's definitely a lack of transdisciplinary thinking uh, within design uh, and research. Um, so the partners, some of the partners are BDP Architects, uh, Siemens, uh, Belfast Queen's University, Manchester International Festival, uh, Salix Homes, Contour Homes, um, community members. Um, so a whole breadth um, of different organisations and people have made this project happen over the last 36 months. What would be the specific sort of roles that an architect could have taken on this particular project? Well, BDP Architects. Uh, give us a, a massive amount of support around the structural integrity of the building uh, which relates to what kind of systems we actually have here um, and that's why the systems that we have in the building are actually unique to this building because they're all based on the structural integrity and we wouldn't be able to do that without support from people like um, Gavin Elliott uh, who was absolutely instrumental in, in the, uh, the, the project um, and a number of his team um, who worked here a lot helping us develop that. Just taking a step back now, how did your education and experiences abroad influence your work in Manchester? Um, really good question uh, because it's definitely not my education um, sitting in universities that have developed my expertise. Uh, my time in uh, Africa, um, in Ethiopia, Nigeria, my time in America, living on streets in New York, San Francisco and Chicago, uh, and my time in Croatia um, have really formulated my expertise. Um, what university has done for my expertise is to help position it within an academic perspective uh, and also within the city itself. Um, so I think what de defines my, my own practice is not what I've done within the university, but actually what I've done outside the university, uh, but using the university model uh, to get to a position where I am now. What inspired you to do to study design before? Um, the real need for more integral design around urban environments. Like we all know 1.3 million people a week, 70 million people a year move into cities. Um, and cities are the most advanced te technological systems that humanity have ever built. Um, and especially being in a city like Manchester where we are centre of the Industrial Revolution um, and all the amazing stuff that came with that. But also through that process, well, there was a lot of um, undesirable um, things that came with it, like destroying off ecological services. And to be a Mancunian, I would like Manchester to be the head of the game when we think about the next revolution, the biospheric economy. Um, and that's been one of the driving forces uh, of my research from day one, uh, to be one of the, the members or one of the small part of the cogs of looking at how Manchester can create a new revolution. Can the sort of system that you develop here be taken over by non-experts? Um, I think that's a challenge, isn't it? Um, we are a community interest company. Um, so one of the, the wishes of the foundation is that we hand this organization over to the um, to the community um, but I always think we will work with innovating designers um, BDP and Siemens uh, world-class engineers because it's necessary to challenge how we think about cities but at the same time we have to integrate 
how communities engage within that innovation. Um, and you can't do that within universities. You have to put the university in the community to do it. Uh, that's the way you engage. Um, so, yes, I think you can do that. You can train people to, to run these systems uh, and make them efficient. And then people can be people who are living in this community. Uh, but you always have to have the relationship between research, um, enterprise and community. Would it be about adapting people, so training them to those systems or adapting the systems to the people to simplify them in a way? Another interesting question. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of simplifying systems. Um, when you simplify systems, especially ecological systems, what you do is we reduce the, the, the complexity. Actually, it means you reduce the, the output and you enhance the input. Uh, what you do is you create unsustainable systems. Um, so I don't think you need to reduce the complexity of systems. I think what you need to do is have a really good engagement tool, a platform, yeah, to not just have a way of parachuting into communities yeah, and try to teach them to then parachute out, but actually a long-term project. Um, and that brings us back to the Biosphere Foundation. Like, we're not a PhD research project. I'm not here for 36 months yeah, to parachute in and parachute out. This is a 10-year program. Um, and it's 10 years because to create behavioural change, you need more than 36 months. You can just about get a PhD done in 36 months. Um, so the 10-year the programme hopefully will give us the platform to, to show, to teach, to learn, to enjoy the time with the community and help them to take the system over um, and go forward with it. So finally... How do you make your academic studies become reality and what advice have you got for an athlete student? I think, uh, I think as a student, the, the least place you're going to learn something with is, with, is within your studio. Um, yes, we have to hand um, lectures in and so on um, and do handings, and, but that's not where you're going to learn your, your, your practice. It's not where you're going to get really inspired. Where you're going to get inspired is within the cities. Uh, and actually being out in like when you've got time in summer and so on go out and do like do stuff that other people aren't doing and that's what se separates you uh, from other architects 99% of architects come out and do normal jobs there's only like the 1% really who do amazing stuff and I'm sure that 1% of the people who are out doing interesting stuff um, and not always listening to your tutors being a little bit of a pain uh, enjoying your time and not put, not trying to get a good mark from your tutor but actually going out there and getting really infused and inspired by the stuff that you love and then bring that into the studio um, and that's what's important nothing else thank you very much thank you